Uh, I'm here to introduce the fireside chat on philanthropy and to share a few thoughts about the role of nonprofit organizations. And as a person who has served on many nonprofit boards over the years, I've had the opportunity to observe firsthand some of the challenges with having charitable organizations function smoothly and be responsive to the communities they serve. And to be honest, when I was asked to introduce a talk on philanthropy, my first question was, really? Because I don't entirely have totally nice things to say about philanthropy. Um, the truth is I uh, got so frustrated with some of the challenges I personally observed and the inefficiencies of the nonprofit environment that I decided to spend my time and resources on techie startups instead. I mean, when you look around, for-profit companies like Apple, Google, and Amazon have revolutionized the way we live and changed the world uh, more than any nonprofit that I was ever personally involved with. And that's because, in the end, Adam Smith was right. The invisible hand and the motive of profit can channel people's self-interest into doing good. Profit, or the lack thereof, is a measure of success that can focus priorities, force difficult conversations, and drive efficient use of resources. And I do believe that adapting the venture capital model to mission-oriented companies and investment promises to be a very innovative path forward for philanthropy. Nonprofits can be very challenging because success is often impossible to measure. What is the value of changing a life or a law? Measurements like engagement, reach, dollars raised are inherently suboptimal because they miss the main point and they may not be particularly correlated with actual effectiveness. Further, the lack of a profit motivation changes the dynamics of a philanthropic organization. How can you tell what the market really wants without the constant feedback from market forces? Instead of making a profit by running a successful company, a philanthropic organization has to make its money by successfully and continually pitching donors. And the major challenges I personally observed in nonprofit environments centered on this tension between the need to raise money and create engagement on the one hand with pursuing innovation on the other. Having to continually raise money can create risk aversion. Donors to a nonprofit may have many motivations, but making money isn't going to be the biggest one. Donors can be motivated by a desire to change the world, but they could also be seeking community with like-minded people, a chance to leave a legacy, or simply getting involved because it's a favor to a friend. But organizations do not always have access to these deeper motivations of donors, particularly in situations where they have large numbers of smaller donors to manage. So once a donor is engaged, changing anything about the model that got them there could create a risk of disengagement, and thus innovation suffers. Most nonprofits also have a few key donors that they rely on for annual contributions to their operating budgets. These donors are especially critical for the organization to keep happy, and if these donors are not interested in changing and adapting to new circumstances, they can unfortunately hold the organization back. For example, there's an old joke about symphony boards, and the joke is that the board members really don't want to hear any music written after 1900. Now, that's a bit of an exaggeration, but it's true that there is a bit of a tension between the donors who want to hear Beethoven's Fifth again and conductors and musicians who may want to showcase emerging artists or try something new to engage a younger generation of audience members. Or, uh, on the other end of the spectrum, there may be donors who want to see change and they're willing to sponsor the new project or program to make it happen. And this can be very positive. But there's also the risk that an organization that's constantly agreeing to new programs to bring in the funding can lose sight of its central mission. If the nonprofit has to engage not only its donors, but other relevant communities, like elected officials, community leaders, businesses, activists, or other consumers or products of, of their products or services, then the challenges get even worse. The larger the community of stakeholders that has to be enrolled, the more difficult it is to innovate, 
basically because anything you change has the potential to alienate some important part of your base of support. And if things go truly poorly, a nonprofit can end up having all of the challenges of a centrally planned economy. A, a central planner has to raise and spend money toward, with an eye toward making its key stakeholders happy and with very little regard to what the general public actually wants from what they're producing. And uh, a nonprofit can run the risk of falling into the same traps. But I have here two nonprofit leaders for our next discussion who have very effectively managed these challenges of enrolling the relevant stakeholders while staying true to their principles. And unsurprisingly, they're both believers in the free market. And what is critical to a free market? Well, it's the word of the day, trust. Building trust is the key to philanthropic success. When everyone is afraid of that major donor's reaction, if the symphony doesn't play Beethoven's fifth again, no one on the team can be their best. In an environment where debate and disagreement are discouraged, safe answers will be prioritized over innovative ones. Or safe answers will be prioritized even over telling the truth. Truth suffers, innovation suffers, and effectiveness suffers. On the other hand, a donor or leader who is fully enrolled in the mission and vision of the organization can be an executive mentor, a fundraiser in chief, and a brand ambassador all rolled into one. What separates this leader from the one who insists on Beethoven's fifth? Again, trust. The leader is enrolled in the mission and trusts the team to execute it. And the team trusts the leader to support them and make it safe to have a dialogue about the vision for the organization. No one has all the right answers, but everyone can ask the right questions. And if the stakeholders in an organization start feeling afraid of asking tough questions, then there's a lack of trust and it's time to make some changes. I'm pleased to introduce two, two people who have balanced the, issue, the interests, the mission, the vision, and the fundraising, Eli Lehrer and Brian Hooks. Eli is the president and founder of R Street and the reason we're all here today. And I've known Eli for over 20 years. And one of the things that's always most impressed me about Eli is his curiosity, not just about public policy, but about everything. One day many years ago, I accompanied him to the Bead Museum in his part of his multi-year quest to see every single museum in Washington, DC. And Eli is the type of person who makes it safe to talk about anything because he's more interested in finding out the truth than he is in being right. And he is more interested in finding out the truth than what other people are going to think of him. At the same time, Eli is never the type to hide the bad news, although he will always deliver it with kindness. And that curiosity and honesty make Eli both an excellent writer and a good leader. Eli and Erica have built R Street from the ground up over the last decade into a powerhouse institution that still values the truth over telling people what they want to hear. In the last 11 years, R Street has grown from five staff to more than 80 and seen a similar rise in its finances. R Street is a success story of building trust through tackling each issue head on and following wherever the research leads them. Brian Hooks is the chairman and CEO of Stand Together a philanthropic network of businessmen and community leaders that helps people find their unique potential. He is also president of the Charles Koch Foundation. Brian is another leader who values truth over team. Brian and Charles Koch recently authored a book called Believe in People, Bottom-Up Solutions for a Top-Down World. And an underlying theme of this book is that choosing the right partners is critical to getting things done. And that might mean working across partisan lines to develop a coalition. Brian's work is based on trust. Brian funds researchers he trusts to find the right answer without micromanaging. In his work at Stand Together, he has also pushed for transparency. Stand Together builds trust by taking principled stands even when it's against their donor's self-interest. For example, Stand Together opposes special interest corporate welfare and believes that businesses should only make money by earning a profit. Even though the business interests that supported his organization could benefit from, federal, from favorable regulation, um, the foundation is committed 
to opposing every policy that would give government handouts to business. And so with that, I'll turn the program over now to Eli and Brian to explore further whether successful philanthropy is free market philanthropy. Thank you. Thank you so much, Susanna, for that introduction, and thank you, Brian, for being here. Yeah, thanks for having me. This is a I feel like we have a lot of work to do after that introduction. We've got to we demonstrate do. it's possible, right? Yeah, it's, it's, it's a tough order. It's a tall order, to say the least. But uh, so our theme today is trust. And you run a major philanthropic community, along with Charles Koch. What can philanthropy do to help build more trust in an increasingly divided world and society? So it's a very big question, and it's one that, that we've thought a lot about, and I know that you all have too, because I understand that the theme for the whole day has been this question of trust. Uh, and so I think that philanthropy does have an important role to play in addressing the challenges right now that are either based on or made a whole lot worse by the deficit in trust. But to, to get at a solution, it's important that we really understand uh, what's causing the problem, what's at the root of the problem. And, and I won't pretend to know the full answer to that. A lot of people have, have talked about uh, specific challenges when it comes to a lack of trust in our society today. Uh, but I think that we're dealing with some just fundamental shifts that are you know, once in several, several generation uh, phenomenon that are really making it pretty difficult to build trust right now. So I think about you know, the, the idea that we're living through massive disruption across several institutions that people have relied on, in some cases, for decades to order their lives. That's not to say that the way that things were was optimal by any stretch, or even good, but they, those institutions, things like education, things like you know, the way that we thought about employment, things that, uh, like government, the way that we interacted with government, or the expectations that we had of political parties, good or bad, they, they were stable uh, to, a, to a large extent. Uh, and today, they're, they're unstable in a big way. They're being disrupted. So you think about the idea that you know, it used to be the case that you, keep, you, you put your head down, you go through your local uh, school, you get a high school diploma, you go to, you go to college, you're going to be fine. You, you might be great, but you're certainly going to be fine. Today, that's just simply not the case. right? I think the, the statistic I've seen recently is that 50% of kids in college right now won't graduate. This is a ma major dis disruption that's causing uncertainty. It's contributing to this lack of trust. You think about the idea that we uh, used to have a couple of jobs in our lives, you know, and, and, and then we would sort of retire and, and, and be okay. You know, today, what is the average tenure at a, at a job? A couple of years. Uh, and, and you ain't seen nothing yet, you know, given the, the progress that, that technology will bring and the disruption that will come with that progress. Anyway, you understand this, but, but if we look at this, any one of those disruptions that happened in somebody's life would be a big deal. The fact that there are all these waves kind of crashing together at the same time is causing people to be very anxious. It's causing people to not trust each other, not trust sort of what they thought uh, they knew about the world. And it's opening them to you know, pretty bad ideas. And so to get to your question, what can philanthropy do to address this? I think philanthropy has a big role in, in addressing this. Not on its own, it's not the, the, the single solution. Um, but you know, I think about where are there concentrated resources to really help develop, identify and develop the institutions of the future that are going to provide the stability uh, that people require to live good lives, not in the same form. We're not going to reach back into the past and pull those institutions back into the future, but, but in a different form that provide the same function. And so you think about where is the, where is the capital concentration? It's in places like, like government. It's in places like business, especially large business. And it's in places like philanthropy. But if we're going to discover things, we need to take risks as a society. And the incentives for, say, government to take big risks just aren't there, right? If you're in government, you get uh, all the blame for the, the things that go wrong and very little of the credit for the things that go well. So why would you take the risks to kind of figure out what comes next? Uh, increasingly, in, in especially in large public companies, right, the, the demand to have quarterly earnings means that it's, uh, it, to be judged by your quarterly earnings means that you're unlikely to sort of shoot for the moon. And so philanthropy seems to be perfectly situated to sort of be this risk-taking institution 
that can really help us to figure out what is the future of education? What is the future of work? How can we solve some of these problems in, in government and politics? What is the future of media, these institutions that we need in order to live well together? And yet, as we just heard, things are pretty screwed up <laughs> in philanthropy and, and in the, the nonprofit world generally. Uh, that doesn't mean we have bad people. We've got a lot of really good people that are well-intentioned, but the incentives tend to be uh, counter to that push to risk taking. Um, and, and you know, what are those incentives? I mean, there's a lot of them. We just heard uh, about some of them uh, in the introduction. But you know, I think about the, um, the way that, that boards work in, in philanthropies, right? It's, you don't want to be embarrassed. You don't want to fail. Well, if we're not willing to fail, we're not going to find the, the, take the risk to, to move things forward. Uh, anybody here at a nonprofit had to fill out a, a grant application that asked you to prove uh, how do you know what you're going to do is going to work? Can you show us where it's worked in the past? Right? Why are we doing that? Right? If, if, it works, if it's worked in the past, you know, and we still have the problems that we have of the present, that's, that's not the solution, right? We need something that hasn't been tried, and you can't, and, you know, by definition, you can't, you can't prove that it's worked in the past. That's the kind of risk aversion that's built into a lot of the way that philanthropy is done. And so there's a lot of other things we could say about this, but I think we need to recognize the nature of the challenge when it comes to the need to rebuild trust, what's actually going on at a foundational level, and then ask the question, what role does business have to play? What role does uh, government have to play? What role does civil society have to play broadly? Um, and what role does philanthropy have to play and what needs to happen in order for philanthropy to play that role? Very, very interesting. Going on this theme of risk taking, um, risk taking obviously requires taking a variety of approaches, taking pluralistic approaches. And you've recently been one of the signatories to, the, to a declaration put together by a group of foundations, some on the left, some on the right that talks about the need for philanthropic pluralism, right. uh, speaking about the way the pluralistic approaches have been denigrated. Uh, tell us a little about that and how it's, um, and, and what the reaction you've seen to it has been. Sure. <laughs> does, any, does anybody know what, what Eli's referencing? There was a, a, an article written in the Chronicle of Philanthropy. Even calling it a declaration, I think, uh, maybe is a, is a bit of a, uh, an exaggeration. Uh, the, the several of us that got together to write this, to be honest with you, we thought it was pretty basic stuff, pretty, pretty banal. Uh, and it was a wonderful group of people. It was Sam Gill, uh, now at Doris Duke. It was uh, Darren Walker, the Ford Foundation. It was Heather uh, uh, Templeton Dill, Kathleen Enright, and, and uh, Elise Westhoff when she was at the uh, Flintford Roundtable. So good, a good group of us. And it really was born out of just an honest discussion about, hey, how do we think about the threats to this diversity of thought, this pluralism in philanthropy. And, and once we had some, some good conversations, we said, I, I think it might be useful for our community to hear what we think as an invitation to have a discussion. Uh, and again, it was pretty basic stuff, right? What is pluralism? Pluralism is a set of principles that allows diverse people, people with different ideas, to live in peace together. You think, well, that, well sure, we all want that. Uh, turns out, no, <laughs> we don't all want that. And that was the reaction uh, from, a, from a fringe sort of um, set of folks, but a set of folks whose voice is increasingly um, you know, authoritative in the conversation in our society. The, the people that advocate for things like cancel culture, um, the people that advocate things like words are violence and therefore we ought to control words and, and, and thoughts and that sort of thing. So I thought it was a pretty productive discussion, actually. I was surprised by the the pushback and the sort of the, the aggressiveness of the pushback. But I think it's important. You know, we face a, a, a real crisis. We'll talk more about this, I think, in, in terms of, you know, are we committed to classical liberal principles? Are we committed to an open and free society where everyone uh, is equal? And we all have the opportunity to develop our gifts and live lives of contribution in the lives of others. Or do we think that some people should have power over others and basically get to set the, uh, set the terms, kind of put their thumb on the scale? And it's important, I think, that we have civil conversations with people who, believe, who don't believe in, in core liberal principles, dignity, equal rights. Let them make the case so that we can expose the, the fallacy of their ideas and we can sort of move beyond them. Because if we don't have that kind of open dialogue, those things tend to fester and they show up in pretty ugly ways. 
Yup. The uh, <laughs> couldn't say that much better, but uh, this trend towards populism, this trend towards wanting to speak for the people in a big way, has historically been associated more with the left than the right in recent history. But we're seeing a big increase in uh, populism from the right as well. Some of it's coming from people who really presented themselves as populists, but also from people like Senator Marco Rubio, who have really presented themselves as traditional classical liberal conservatives. This seems to pose a challenge to organizations like the ones both of us had that are grounded in these classical liberal principles of free markets and free people. Uh, how can we do more as classical liberals to show the way that an ideology of freedom and free markets speaks to the needs of everyday people better than populism? Well, you know, like one of the things I've always respected about you is your even keel. And so to frame what we're going through right now is, is a bit of a challenge, I think, uh, understates things. Um, but you, know, you need an even keel in order to really kind of understand how to address it. And I, and I want to give you and our street a whole lot of credit for being out in front on this issue and, and being very principled uh, in your assessment and then in your, your reaction to it. Uh, I think it's more than a bit of a challenge. I think it is a hair on fire moment <laughs> for anybody who cares about a free society and the vision of progress that the, the principles that are at the core of our society have enabled for free people to live well together. Um, there is a increasing uh, bias towards, towards top-down control, towards authoritarianism, towards the violation of those principles. And as you say, it's, it's, it's always been present in our society. It, ten, it has tended to come from more of a fringe and more of sort of people who have identified as statists or, or you know, people on the progressive left. Uh, and, in, and in the past several years, we've seen this resurgence uh, of these ideas on pe from people who have, who have identified on the political right. And I think when that happens, when you get this sort of convergence of people who are enamored of power, uh, bad things happen really fast. And so I do think that we need, to, we need to call it for what it is. We need to see it as a hair on fire moment, an existential threat. Uh, and those of us who are committed to you know, making progress in a free society, in a liberal society together, through all of that, the, the, the difficulty that that entails, um, we, need to stand, we need to stand up for these principles. We need to uh, make the argument in a very clear and civil, I mean a very you know, uh, civil way, but a very clear way that, um, that there is a, a tremendous amount of evidence that a free society is the best way for people to live well together to make progress. And that when we seed, uh, seed that to those who, who would try to sort of micromanage our lives and control us from the top down, bad things happen. And, uh, and I think this is a very real threat. But you guys, again, I mean, I think, I think you can speak to this as well. I mean, you, uh, you and I have had lots of conversations about really checking, all of us checking ourselves and really sort of grounding ourselves in those first principles. Um, I think the, the, the thing that we can't do is we can't pretend that the problems that are causing people to turn to these ideas don't exist. They do exist. And we have to be able to engage with why you know, protectionism when it comes to trade policy, though it may feel good, doesn't work. It actually makes people's lives better. That doesn't mean that we don't need to re-examine the way that our economy works or what we're doing to ensure that people can really thrive in, a, in an economy that's moving much, much faster than it has before. Um, but there are ways to address those challenges that are consistent with the principles of progress and don't sort of give in to these top-down strongmen charlatans who ultimately kind of know in the back of their mind that well, whether, whether this works for everybody, I'm going to be OK. <laughs> uh, we need people like, like, I think, all of us here who really sort of care about not just, will I be OK, but are we going to make progress as a society? This is a big deal. When it comes to social progress, a lot of the things that are important uh, take a while. And Larry Kramer, the outgoing president of the Hewlett Foundation, yeah. has observed that uh, Philanthropy often uh, can accomplish a lot in the short term, and that people often 
underestimate what it can accomplish while overestimating what can be done in the short term. Uh, in this con, first, what do you think of that idea? And second, uh, in the context of what you call a hair on fire moment, uh, if you're on the same page as Larry, how can philanthropy's ability to influence things in the long term uh, be used to deal with a problem that clearly is a clear and present danger? Yeah, well, first off, I, I, I try to take anything that Larry says very seriously. Uh, he's one of my favorite people, and I've learned a ton from the back and forth conversations with Larry. I, I think somebody, Larry's a great example in my mind of somebody who has uh, an extraordinary uh, commitment to his convictions, and at the same time is extraordinarily open to having them challenged and, and have a good back and forth to, so, that, so that everybody comes out having learned something. Uh, so I want to I I think hard about what Larry might mean when he says that. Uh, I think that it is the case that a lot of people, when they think about philanthropy, uh, think about the immediate short-term needs of, of people, especially needs associated with, say, poverty or, or uh, health issues, really, really important things in our society. And so there's a lot of focus on those short-term benefits that philanthropy can, can provide or the problems in the short term that people can, can address. And I, th I think what he means when he says we overemphasize that is that, well, yes, for sure, we can help people in the short term. If we don't address the, the root causes, those problems persist. And I think that's right. Uh, when he says we underestimate what can be accomplished in the long term, uh, that's an interesting proposition. Again, I'd, I'd want to think hard about that. Um, it's funny, we talk to people who are uh, sort of consider themselves from the, the left. They always complain about how their coalition never focuses on the long term and the right's really got it right. And then you hang out with people on the right and they say the same thing about the left. Um, I'm, I'm very uh, fortunate uh, to, to work with philanthropists uh, that are part of the Stand Together community who think long term. And I think about some of the real big wins in philanthropy recently, things like criminal justice, um, modernization, I think was Jerome's language, but the reform that was achieved uh, over the past couple of decades, it's just surfaced. And it really is. It's a big deal, and it's real. But these are the results of investments of many people really over the past 30 and 40 years. And we got involved uh, in Ernest's Stand Together back in 2003. Um, but you know, people like Charles Koch were investing in trying to stop the drug war, say, in the 70s. So long-term thinking can produce really meaningful results, but sometimes it does take a while. You could say the same thing about what we're seeing in education right now. There are a lot of very committed people whose sort of toil uh, 30 years ago is now paying off in greater opportunities for families and kids. So I do think that there's a lot that philanthropy can do uh, if you bring uh, a sense of long-term thinking and, and a real commitment to progress. Um, and you know, if you, in, in defining progress as helping society move more in line with these principles that enable everyone to realize their potential. Fantastic. So we are getting close to the end of this conversation. And I wanted to ask you a little bit more about the Stand Together community in particular. Mm -hmm. uh, Forbes just reported on this new um, Believe in Pe People venture that's been launched as part of the community. Uh, which takes its title from a book uh, that you wrote with Charles Koch. Excellent book, by the way. It's in the back of the room. I will plug it for you. Thank you for plugging uh, the book. But it is, uh, it, it is honestly uh, a really interesting book. Uh, one, of the, one of the more um, personal books I've also read um, about philanthropy, uh, which is a very interesting thing coming from a leading philanthropist. Uh, but in that context, could you tell us just a little more about what um, about this venture and what you're proud of that you're working on right now at Stand Together? Sure. Well, a lot, hopefully a lot of people here um, know Stand Together. We're a philanthropic community. We're kind of an odd duck in philanthropy for a lot of reasons. We're not a single benefactor organization. We work with about a thousand different philanthropists, business leaders. People from all different backgrounds, different perspectives, they've come together under this banner, uh, this organization, Stand Together. We do a lot of different things, but the through line to everything we do is that we're helping people to realize their potential by better applying these principles that have always 
uh, been responsible for progress over, over time. And so the more that we can remove barriers holding people back, the more those people benefit, but, that, but, but, but that's also how we benefit, how we prosper as a society. And, and so those philanthropists and business leaders that provide the resources to you know, a couple thousand different organizations that we're fortunate to partner with and to support um, to make up the, the strategies and the, the, the ecosystems, the, the environments that help to move, uh, move us past really hard problems like, like challenges in education, like challenges in the economy, like challenges in the criminal justice system, like the need for a more open and free society when it comes to free speech, the, the big problems in society. They provide resources to our teams and to the organizations we support to do the work. You know, our street has been a phenomenal partner in this work for, for many years. And so this, um, this article in Forbes last week, and if you haven't seen it, I'd encourage you to read it. Uh, it's a nice story about sort of what Charles Koch and his family have contributed as, as founding members of Stand Together. Charles was our founder, but now there's, there's many, many people that are, that are helping make this work possible. And the, the organization you're referring to, Believe in People, is a new um, uh, set of resources that Charles has made available to organizations that share the vision of Stand Together to kind of make this, make this happen. And so, you know, it's, it's incredible to my mind. You know, I've known Charles for t 23 years. I learn something new every time I talk to him, and I talk to him pretty frequently. Um, his commitment to these principles and to this vision that no single person, no single organization is going to be able to, on its own to, to take down these really big problems. But the more that we can facilitate uh, the cooperation and sort of, as, as he would say, the division of labor by comparative advantage, the, the, the way that markets uh, create value, the more that we can replicate that in, in this world, in this world of philanthropy, the more that we can do. Put simply, uh, there, there, there is a whole lot more that all of us together can get done than any one of us can on our own. And so his, uh, his generosity in, in, in providing resources over time has been a, a big part of allowing this to happen. And this Forbes article shares um, the latest way that he's done that. And that really is what the Believe in People organization is. Fantastic. Well, I think we are near our time to wrap up. Thank you so much, Brian, for uh, taking the time to be with us today. And thank you to the Stand Together community and the others of you from Stand Together who are here in the audience today. We're grateful for your support and partnership. Well, thanks, Eli. Appreciate what you're doing. Thank you. Thank you.